Uh, well, good morning from London, uh, good afternoon from Busan. We're publishing today a new report on developments in maritime finance and maritime financial centres, published jointly by ZN and the Busan Financial Centre. Uh, the report, which is available on our website this morning, focuses on developments in maritime finance, including emergency, emerging fintech applications and new derivatives, uh, but also the focus required by the shipping industry on net zero uh, and the financing options uh, that are required to uh, help the industry move forward. Um, I'm delighted to welcome this morning, um, first of all, colleagues from Busan Finance Centre, um, and we'll be hearing in a moment some welcome remarks from uh, Ms. Jessica Mee Park, um, who will add her, her welcome. Um, and to introduce our two speakers today, Simon Mills, a senior consultant here at ZN, who's the author of our report, and Professor Hee Sung Yun, who's Dean of the Graduate School of Maritime Finance at the National Korea Maritime and Ocean University. Um, you probably know me, I'm Mike Wardle, I'm today's chair uh, from ZN, chief executive here. Um, and my job today is to moderate the session um, and in particular to moderate the questions uh, and answers that we'll have time for uh, after we hear from our speakers. Um, you can raise questions on the GoToWebinar system by typing your questions and thoughts uh, into the questions tab on the dashboard on your screen. And you can do that at any point during the webinar. So if something strikes you, uh, you don't have to wait for the Q&A session to put your question in. Please uh, keep your questions coming uh, during, during the session. We will be recording today's um, webinar. So um, if you find it particularly interesting and want to go back and hear it again, or if you have friends and colleagues who you think might be interested, uh, the recording will be available and be posted on our website in a couple of days' time. Um, so that'll be available uh, for you as well. And of course, the report is available to download from our website this morning. That's all, by the way, of my uh, brief introduction, I think. Um, and I would like to invite uh, Jessica Park from Busan Finance Center to add her welcome remarks. Okay. Good morning and good evening. <laughs> okay, I'm Jessica Park, a director of the Busan Financial Center, BFC. Uh, first, would like to extend our sincere thanks to Mr. Mike Waddle and uh, Mr. Samuel Mills for your valuable contribution to completing the report. Uh, this document is really important as it set out the path for Busan to become a major uh, maritime financial center in East Asia. Uh, right now, with everything moving online and a big focus on cutting carbon emissions in the maritime industry, uh, there are a lot of challenges to tackle worldwide. Uh, to handle this crucial moment well, we need to take a quick action uh, through research projects and changing laws and putting new policies in place and coming up with innovative financial ideas. In line with this global need, Zian Yan's latest report offers a wide range of ideas and plans to strengthen maritime finance in Busan, South Korea. By making the most of the financial technology and a specialized finance product, this report uh, provides a strong base for sustainable growth in Busan's maritime financial sector. This report is not just for people in the industry, it is also set to strengthen the collaborations between the Busan Finance Center and the GNN, both well respected names in maritime circles. As Busan becomes more established, as a top maritime finance hub in the area, this report will drive innovation and partnerships in the sector. Uh, thank you, and thank you for all attending the webinar for today. Thank you very much for those kind words of welcome and setting the scene. And I'd like, now like to invite Simon Mills, the author of today's report, um, to give an overview of the findings. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Mike. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon in Busan. My name is Simon Mills. I'm the senior consultant at the ZN Group, and I'm going to take you through some of the key findings of our research into maritime finance centres. Next slide, please. 
Before I begin, I must say a few words about Zien. We're the City of London's leading financial services think tank. We focus on the nexus between society, finance and technology, and we draw on a library of highly skilled experts who help us deliver research and services for the public, private and voluntary sector. Our not-for-profit programmes include Long Finance, which asks the question, when would we know that our financial system is working? And it also publishes a range of indices design, designed to reveal the competitiveness of the world's financial centres. Next slide, please. Now, I'm afraid that I only have uh, limited time to give the shallowest of overviews of the report today. There is a great deal of information packed into its 82 pages <clears throat> and I would urge you to download it and peruse it at your leisure. This was an absolutely fascinating project to work on because of the vital importance of this sector to the global economy. The global merchant fleet has more than doubled in size over the last 40 years. It's responsible for supporting around 90 percent of the global commodity trade and contributes over $380 billion to the global economy from freight rates alone. And next slide, please. When you add in activities such as shipbuilding, port terminal fees and financial services such as broking, finance and insurance, the sector is worth more than $14 trillion per annum. Next slide, please. Now, interestingly, the, the locus of this activity has shifted steadily westwards over the last five millennia in a phenomenon known as the West Line. The pace of this drift has accelerated rapidly over the last hundred years or so. So perhaps by the end of the century, we're going to see the rapid expansion of maritime activity in India and East Africa. There's more information on the key locations for maritime activity in the report. Next slide, please. However, it is obvious to those who work in the maritime sector that despite its vital importance, it's often neglected by politicians and the public, possibly because it happens out of the public gaze at sea or in offices or in secure area ports. Yet maritime centers contribute enormous amounts of value to national economies, driving investment, jobs and demand. There's even evidence that nations with thriving maritime financial centres have actually got a higher GDP than those who do not. Next slide, please. So what are the factors that predicate success for a maritime finance centre and the financial services that it supports? Now, obviously, clustering is essential. This is the geographical concentration of interconnected companies, specialised suppliers, service providers, firms in related industries and associated institutions such as universities, standards agencies and, and trade associations that allow these organisations to compete but also cooperate. Supporting these organisations, there must be strong local government <clears throat> and effective regulatory agencies that engage and work with maritime organisations in order to deliver effective services and infrastructure. It's vital to remember that although maritime financial centres have historic status of sports, past success is no, guaranteed, no guarantee of continuing re relevance. Venice lost its crown by losing a war. Liverpool failed to invest. New Orleans was rendered obsolete by the new technology of the railway. A centre cannot rest on its laurels. And if you note this picture here, this is Busan Port, where a multi-million dollar investment has taken place in autonomous freight vehicles. So perhaps this is the future. Next slide, please. But what about the financial services that support all this activity? Well, the criteria for success for both financial services and maritime financial services are broadly similar. There needs to be a clustering of related financial services, an enabling business environment, effective infrastructure and readily available human capital. This is important as maritime finance is a specialist field and this means that 
smaller, more nimble centres can actually outcompete larger centres in providing high value legal, financial, insurance and brokerage services. Next slide, please. So what are the key challenges which are facing the maritime sector at the moment? Well, let's start with finance. Buying a vessel is expensive. In March 2023, the Swiss-based private shipping firm MSC took delivery of the, the, took delivery of the ultra-large container vessel, the MSC Tessa. Built at the Shangjing shipyard in Shanghai, this vessel is part of a four-ship leasing deal estimated to have cost in excess of $600 million. Now, obviously, this is at the top end, but even the price of second-hand handy size carriers has soared since the pandemic. Unfortunately, the maritime sector is subject to extreme volatility in demand. The cost of bunker fuel, access to shipping routes and the state of the global economy all have a major effect on demand and profitability. After the 2008 financial crisis, Banks became risk averse and as a result, they've scaled back exposure or withdrawn completely from ship finance. This having been said, European banks still hold a 49% share of the global market and Asian and Australian bank share has increased to 44%. However, the end result of this risk aversion is that much traditional financing has been replaced by convertible debt, private equity, bonds and sale and leaseback agreements. Interestingly, one factor that has gained in significance over the last few years is the issue of ESG performance. Now, this is covered in more detail in the report, but suffice to say, there are new profitable opportunities for maritime financial center, centers to explore products such as green bonds, sustainability linked bonds and sustainability linked learn, loans to meet the demand for finance in this sector. Next slide, please. Speaking of opportunities, it's evidence that the maritime finance sector has been relatively slow to grasp the opportunities of fintech. In part, this might be because fintech platforms are of more utility to smaller ship owners. Large ship owners can find cheaper money through listings or bonds. However, there have been some very exciting developments in the blockchain tokenization of real world assets. These platforms transform marine assets into digital assets, which can be traded publicly. Now, this is significant because it allows fractional ownership, allowing small investors to spread risk and potentially bringing in a new source of finance to the sector. Next slide, please. Now, before we move on, I really need to address the elephant in the room. Transactions in the maritime sector are slow and expensive. They often require the transfer of physical documentation passing through the hands of several intermediaries. Processing and administration costs can be as much as 20% of cargo fees. Enormous efficiencies could be realized through the use of blockchain technology. And we examine some of the issues holding back the introduction of FinTech in the report. Suffice to say, addressing this area would be as revolutionary to the sector as when Malcolm McLean introduced the shipping container back in 1956. Next slide, please. Moving on, we were surprised to find just how deeply the issue of climate change and carbon management has impacted the maritime sector. I'm sure you're all aware of how climate change exacerbated drought in Panama has impacted on the capacity of the, the Panama Canal with knock-on effects for shipping worldwide. However, the impacts of climate change policies and the drive towards net zero have a deeper impact across the sector. This has got two aspects in terms of direct emissions and in terms of cargo. With respect to the first, the IMO has introduced a suite of standards and regulations concerning efficiency and emissions, which have got significant implications for market access, vessel value, access to finance, fleet composition, speed of fleet renewal and technological innovation. 
We deal with all of these in the report, but it is worth dwelling on the issue of stranded assets for a moment. As a result of these regulations, older, less efficient vessels will have to be scrapped or refitted, which is a boon for the shipbuilding industry and research and development. However, if you're a ship owner, the value of your company is almost entirely held in the vessels that you own. If your vessels are no longer able to dock at European ports, or clients no longer wish to charter them as their carbon emissions beach, breach regulations, their value will crash as will the value of your firm, making it harder to refinance. Moving on to cargo, the jury is still out as to when the hydrogen economy will take off, but it is likely that hydrogen transportation will rise to become as important as oil transportation, with significant implications for both fleet composition and portside infrastructure. For maritime financial centres, it's worth thinking about when hydrogen will become a traded commodity and putting infrastructure in place to steal a march on your competitors. And so we move on to our conclusions. Next slide, please. The first is fairly self-evident. Maritime financial centres are generally located in port cities. Port cities function as both ports and cities. The port and its host city are codependent. So effective governance and investment in infrastructure are critical. The health of a maritime financial centre is dependent on the ease of establishing a business and the legal constraints and protection surrounding it. The availability of skilled personnel, the availability of pro appropriate premises, access to information technology and the cost of funds relative to other locations. Although the ease of access to customers can be modified by communications and information technology, Ultimately, the cluster effect remains essential. Next slide, please. In order to remain relevant, maritime financial centres must embrace the challenge of financing the maritime industry. They must work with stakeholders in the financial services sector to identify the obstacles and opportunities associated with developing new financial products for ship owners. They must embrace the challenge of net zero. In particular, they must co collaborate to navigate an effective course through this undertaking, whilst competing to find new products and services which will enhance their reputations and attract new business. And they must embrace technolog technological advancements by working together to develop commonly agreed standards in fintech and digitalization, which will allow the rollout of this technology globally. Next slide, please. Now, finally, in the course of this research, we found two very interesting areas which lay outside the scope of this study, which, which would benefit from further investigation. The first is the issue of fleet bifurcation. The US and Europe have made increasing use of sanctions as a mean, means of projecting foreign policy. These sanctions cover a range of trading nations, particularly Russia and Iran, and affect vessels which dock at ports, making intership transfers or carrying goods from affected countries. Vessels breaking these sanctions violate the terms of their insurance and are unable to dock at European or US ports. However, a grey fleet is emerging, which, although primarily involving older, smaller vessels, may actually be as large as 18% of the global fleet. These vessels flout IMO regulations by disabling their automatic identification systems, they employ location hiding technologies, and they engage in location falsification in order to break sanctions. Analysis of the implications of this trend and recommendations on how to counter them might actually be a useful area for further investigation. Now, secondly, coming back to the issue of carbon, there's been a, a great deal of attention paid to the carbon emissions of the global merchant fleet. However, the geographical location of certain forms of manufacturing industry, which are near natural um, resources or manufactured resources or draw on low carbon energy sources, may actually result in a net carbon saving that outweigh the carbon emissions of sea transportation. Although this flies in the face of the current trend for deglobalizations, further research could actually examine whether there is a carbon accounting case to be made for maritime finance. 
thank you very much for your your time this morning uh, i believe that the report is now available for download thank you mike well thank you very much indeed simon <clears throat> for that overview of the content of the report and um, we've put into the chat uh, a link to the um, download where you can uh, grab a copy of the report uh, to go at, into it in more detail. Um, but I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Hisung Yun, um, the Dean of the Graduate School of Maritime Finance at the National Korea Maritime and Ocean University, to add his uh, thoughts and commentary uh, on the report and the issues facing maritime finance. Over to you, Professor Yun. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will uh, make a kind of uh, verbal presentation. Uh, sorry for not being able to uh, make a PPT presentation, uh, but I, I think you can you can follow what, what I'm saying. Uh, before I move on, I'll uh, briefly introduce myself. I have worked for uh, shipping industry for over 25 years, and, I, uh, and then I joined KMI. Uh, KMI is a kind of Public Research Institute for Government Maritime Policy. Uh, and uh, about four years ago, I joined uh, uh, KMOU, uh, the National Korea Maritime and Ocean University. And I'm now heading the Graduate School of Maritime Finance. Um, I'm supposed to make some comments on the ZN's uh, research reports, but uh, uh, honestly, I don't have uh, uh, much to say uh, be because the uh, report is well organized and uh, it has got wide coverage, including uh, shipping market, freight derivatives, derivatives fintech, uh, decarbonization and digitalization. Uh, quite understandably, it, it didn't dig deeply into every topic, but uh, it, it I believe that it is quite uh, uh, effective in covering um, the the topics uh, uh, for 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 us and for Busan. Uh, if the report can be topped up with uh, successive uh, research, I would like to have some more practical suggestions suggestions for Busan. Instead of making some comments on your reports, I'd like to add some more, uh, some kind of personal points on Busan Finance Center. Uh, my presentation consists of four parts. The first part is uh, Busan's stance in Korea. The second is uh, Busan's endowments. Uh, endowments meaning uh, attractiveness. And the third part is going to be why Busan has to go for uh, maritime finance. And the last bit is uh, what is needed for the future. The identity of Busan is quite uh, multifaceted because uh, uh, the central government uh, designated Busan as a finance center together with Seoul. So it has got identity of finance center and uh, the Busan metropolitan government, uh, they said, uh, they actually declared Busan as a kind of maritime capital in the Far East. And uh, uh, sorry. I forgot to uh, mute my phone. Sorry about that. Uh, Busan is also a blockchain specialized zone. And uh, additionally, Busan is aiming for opportunity development specialized zone uh, for the maritime finance sector. Uh, then I move on to Busan's endowments. Uh, which is, I said, you know, the attraction of uh, Busan. Busan has got well-developed maritime industry. Uh, we have world's leading shipping yards. Shipping yards are well supported by uh, equipment industry. And uh, we have got uh, uh, large Busan ports. 
and uh, uh, Busan boasts of uh, one of the largest uh, ship management clusters in the world. In the end, you know, uh, Busan is already an established maritime center. In Korea, about three quarters of Korean maritime industry is accumulated in the southeastern part of the Korean Peninsula. We also have uh, financial institutions uh, accumulated in Busan, mainly uh, policy financial institutions, meaning public government-run financial institutions. Uh, we are going to integrate the Maritime Finance Center, which is co-established by KDB, Kexim, and Kshore. We have got Kemco, KOBC, and uh, quite recently, government decided to uh, move the headquarters of KDB to Busan. And we have some other uh, financial or finance related institutions such as uh, Korea Exchange, KSD, Kibo, and Hawk. And uh, the cultural aspect is uh, another thing that Busan is. Uh, is taking pride in. Uh, the cultural depth in Korea is well recognized in the world. And on top, top of that, these days, uh, Korean culture, say K, K culture, is quite popular in the world. We have got well established uh, infrastructure. ICT is uh, one of the most advanced in the world. We have got good transportation system. Then the settlement conditions for foreigners are excellent. Korea is quite safe, uh, you know, a safe country, and Busan is no exception. And uh, we have got very good level of medical services, foreign schools. And Busan has got uh, uh, educational institutions three national universities, including KMOU. And we have got a Graduate School of Maritime Finance, which is quite unique in Asia. And other maritime related uh, research institutions are uh, Korea Maritime Institute, uh, Kiosk, and we have got Korea uh, Register of Shipping uh, in Busan. Then I'll move on to uh, why Busan has to go for uh, maritime finance. First of all, uh, as Simon mentioned, you know, maritime field is ever growing, which is uh, coincided by uh, 2D in the maritime industry. And 2D stands for uh, digitalization and decarbonization. Uh, firstly, decarbonization um, research shows that uh, hundreds of billions of dollars or even uh, you know several trillion dollars are needed to respond to environmental regulations mainly imposed by IMO and my research shows that Korea only needs about 100 billion US dollars to replace all the existing vessels to net zero uh, new building ships uh, by 2050. Uh, in the area of digitalization, the fourth industrial revolution is dramatically changing the industry landscape. Say, big data, AI, and blockchain is widely applied to the shipping industry, resulting in maritime autonom autonomous surface ship, cargo tracing system, and uh, other uh, devices to in enhance safety and efficiency and energy saving. You know, in the way of uh, responding to uh, 2D changes, the finance is playing a critical role. 
uh, 2D requires huge investments. As I said uh, uh, previously with uh, 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 Simon, there, uh, there is a funding gap. Uh, you know, people in the shipping and ship finance industry are talking about funding gap, uh, meaning we need a lot of uh, capital to respond to the uh, environmental uh, regulations, but uh, traditional financial institutions cannot cope with uh, the requirements. So there must be some innovative solutions. And uh, uh, I think Busan is well uh, uh, prepared to uh, respond to the changes and devise a lot of uh, different type of innovative solutions. Anyway, uh, you know, to answer to the question, why Busan has to go for uh, uh, maritime finance? It seems to be inevitable with the endowments, with the changes, with the shipping industry, with the shipbuilding industry, with the ports, and uh, with uh, the blockchain developments, with fourth industrial uh, revolution technologies that we have in Korea. Then what do we have to do in the future? You know, uh, some topics, most of the topics were covered in the ZN reports. Uh, I will uh, try to add some more uh, to the uh, reports. Basically, uh, Busan need to respond to the changes. My key words for the response is convergence. Uh, I thought about uh, five areas of convergence. Uh, the first one is the AI and finance. Uh, the second one is the convergence of blockchain and finance. The third one is fintech and finance. The fourth one is ESG and finance. The last one is shipping derivatives and finance. I will uh, briefly uh, explain uh, all the five topics. AI can make maritime and maritime finance industry a lot healthier uh, by means of uh, enabling the forecasting, the defaults, and or uh, bankruptcy of uh, the borrowers. And uh, AI technology can be adopted to forecast shipping markets which is enhancing the visibility of the ship financiers and shipping players. And uh, AI technology can be uh, used to enhance efficiency through optimization of uh, uh, equipment operation. Uh, in Korea, in Busan, KMI, uh, Korea Maritime Institute, and other research institutions are making uh, a good contribution in this respect. Uh, the second point is uh, blockchain and finance. Uh, you know, if you think about the blockchain, uh, it, you, 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 I mean, the natural uh, development is, uh, is the application of SDO to the shipping finance. Uh, I mean, uh, security token offering. Uh, ships are quite expensive assets. Uh, it, uh, you know, even uh, small, simple vessels require uh, tens of millions of dollars per vessel. Uh, because it's expensive, the general public cannot approach ship finance directly. Uh, STO is a kind of innovative mechanism to make the fractional ownership of the vessel possible. Uh, that is uh, quite effective in solving the accessibility problems. Uh, the fintech and finance convergence is another way of uh, uh, mechanism to solve that uh, uh, accessibility problem. I believe that 
you know, there are many different types and approaches to the fintech uh, that can be utilized in finance. But uh, I try, I, I, I emphasize uh, the potential of metaverse uh, uh, to be utilized in uh, either shipping or, or generally finance. The ESG, uh, the convergence of ESG and finance is uh, quite interesting and quite important because, uh, because of the environmental regulations and the environmental concerns of the general public. Uh, the green finance, sustainability linked finance, and transition finance is all uh, tried and tested in the, uh, in the shipping industry. And I believe that Busan is in a position to expand uh, ESG related finance uh, backed by uh, the shipbuilding capabilities, well-developed shipping industries, and uh, you know, uh, the fourth industrial uh, technologies that uh, Korea has. The last uh, uh, point is the convergence of shipping derivatives and finance. Uh, Pusan is thinking about establishing derivatives exchange. And in this area, KOBC is working on uh, you know, publishing uh, shipping indices uh, uh, you know, to complement uh, the existing Baltic indices. And uh, based, I mean, if the indices is functioning, that uh, then uh, we can actually uh, activate uh, the derivatives market, and uh, derivatives exchange can play uh, an important role uh, in the in the finance center. And uh, the the other thing that is important is margin call finance, because uh, basically. Uh, you know, the tools that uh, is used in the shipping industry is FFAs. Uh, FFAs uh, a, a stand for uh, forward freight agreements. It's forward agreements, uh, uh, basically, uh, forward uh, uh, agreement is, uh, uh, say, uh, over the counter uh, transaction and not cleared. But because of the uh, uh, credit risk, uh, emerged uh, since the collapse of the market in the in the 2000 in 2009, uh, most of the FFA uh, transactions are cleared. Uh, the clearance system requires margin call finance, um, and uh, uh, Pusan and other financial institutions institutions playing in, in, in Busan Maritime Center uh, uh, can provide uh, margin call finance to the shipping industry. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I thought about is quite uh, a difficult concept, but uh, we have to think about the tokenization of uh, shipping derivatives, uh, which is a mixture of uh, blockchain technology and shipping derivatives and finance. Uh, I thought about option selling, which is uh, suffering from lack of liquidity, and uh, uh, the tokenization, I believe, uh, uh, is quite effective in solving the liquidity problems. Uh, there are uh, some other issues that uh, Pusan uh, needs to pay attention. Uh, uh, the, the first one is uh, we need to invite more uh, global shipping companies and global commercial banks uh, and financial institutions to uh, Busan. Uh, to do that, uh, Busan and uh, the central government needs to um, provide uh, more incentives, uh, like uh, like in Bus like in Singapore. And uh, uh, the second point is uh, we need to uh, go global. Uh, more than now, uh, meaning uh, we need to uh, make a kind of environment uh, more, say, alien-friendly uh, uh, Pusan. 
it, it is quite uh, uh, complicated efforts because uh, uh, not, not one institution can uh, provide that sort of environment. Uh, we need a kind of uh, collaborated uh, efforts uh, uh, to achieve uh, true global uh, business environment in Busan. Uh, as you know, uh, not everything that I mentioned is executed in Busan, but uh, Busan is working on it, and the future of Busan will be quite different from now in the future. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation in the seminar and uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Yun. Um, and I'm sure everyone will be looking uh, to see how successfully Busan uh, takes forward some of the ideas that you have been talking about uh, as we go forward. Uh, we do have a short time for questions uh, and comments. Um, and Alexander Dmitrenko has asked, um, he comes from a company called CPay, who's been building a banking and software solutions for the maritime industry. Um, and the issue that he faces is compliance in the international um, panorama. And just ask, is there a way, are there ways to start developing global financial systems that would supersede and normalize multiple local jurisdictions and create a worldwide maritime financial connecting um, tissue? Uh, Simon, do you want to have a go at that one? My goodness, that's a, a big question. Um, yes, it would be lovely to have um, borderless finance and seamless transactions and to create global systems uh, for this type of financial product. However, um, local jurisdictions fiercely defend their um, their independence and, and for good reasons. Uh, you know, you need to ensure that you do due diligence, that you know the customer that you're dealing with, etc. I think that it is unlikely because of this that there is going to be uh, at any time in the near future a body uh, set up with international jurisdiction which would be uh, able to impose its will on um, different regulatory regimes. This having been said, um, the way forward is for um, financial centres to collaborate. Um, if they have uh, mem um, a memorandum of understanding or, or um, treaties which enable cross-border trade, uh, that is, is, is one way of addressing the issue, but it would be piecemeal. It certainly wouldn't be a system that could be imposed globally. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> uh, we've got quite a few questions to get through, so we're going to ask you for a very short uh, commentary. Um, Con Keating's asked the, uh, to expand on the question of tokenization of marine assets. Um, and really, is this likely to provide uh, meaningful investment opportunities? Um, you know, we've, we've seen some examples of it. And just wonder, Professor Yun, whether you've got an insight about whether tokenization is going to provide a, a good market for investment. The tokenization has has been tried and tested in many uh, different areas in the world. Uh, you know, uh, uh, then the the thing is, uh, like in Korea, you know, uh, a lot of startups are uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, go for STOs uh, for ship investments. But uh, as as in many other many other countries, Korean government is quite stubborn in keeping the regulatory framework, uh, the existing regulatory frame framework uh, that has been applied uh, to the security market for a long period of time. Uh, that is the main hurdle, and uh, the government is slowly changing their standing standing points, and. Uh, in I, I don't know whether it's going to be in the near future or in in, in the future you know uh, 
anyway, I think uh, the, the, the gate will be open uh, slowly because the benefit is there. You know, uh, uh, you know, general public um, uh, can be access to the to the to the ship ship investments, and uh, um, in a way, uh, because of the funding gap that I mentioned, uh, that's sort of uh, uh, innovative uh, solutions can be the only solution that we have in the future. And I think it's also worth adding this, that this would just be one way that a ship owner can uh, can raise raise finance. Um, it's already happening. Shipfinex dot com, which is uh, based in London, um, has already developed a, a platform, and TMC Shipping has become the first company to actually tokenize its its assets on on ship fine of fine X. So um, they obviously think it's it, it, it's worth doing. Um, I know that other uh, nations, including Bustan, are, are looking at this, uh, this avenue. Uh, there is a, a, a startup in Busan called buy sell standards dot uh, com, um, which is it which is, is is beginning to put the the, the building blocks in place to uh, to emulate this, this 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 type of platform, I think it will be added to the the panoply of of, of funding options that that ship owners have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon. A couple of questions I'm going to direct to you from Nikki Holzhausen. Uh, first of all, um, what what effect does shipping have on marine life, and which laws govern these um, impacts and how they're affected, or is that still a developing area? Um, but the second question also is the question of energy intensity of blockchain uh, technology. So really the environmental impact of shipping um, in the round. Um, do you want to just give a very brief commentary on those? I know it's a big topic, I know, but... Uh... Okay, uh, right. It is a very big topic. The IMO has a suite of regulations uh, with regards to uh, managing the uh, the impacts of, of, of shipping on... Uh, that's sorry. That's the International Maritime Organization has a uh, a suite of, of of regulations and standards regarding um, shipping impact on 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 biodiversity. Um, it was out of scope of 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 this particular report, but there are uh, you know a, a great deal of online assets uh, that you can use to 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 examine this further. Um, with regards to the energy intensity of uh, of blockchain, it is important not to conflate blockchain with Bitcoin. Blockchain is a system, Bitcoin is a product, and Bitcoin is very energy intensive in, in, indeed, but there are other blockchain systems available. Ethereum has a far, far lower carbon footprint than uh, than blockchain, something like ninety percent lower, and indeed, uh, Zien has its own proprietary system, ChainZ, um, which is lower than than both of these. So don't conflate um, blockchain with Bitcoin. Blockchain is the uh, the system, and Bitcoin is a product. So it, it it doesn't necessarily mean that you're increasing. Uh, carbon emissions by using blockchain systems uh, for various aspects of, of, of marine finance and, and, and maritime activity. Um, Ian Stewart asked, asked a question which maybe is beyond the scope, I think, of the report, but you know, have we got any view about how the G7 sanctions are like to play out with so much, so many attempts to, to bust the sanctions uh, by the shadow fleet? Um, any thoughts well, Mike, on that? Mike, you'll, you'll like this one. My, my view is that uh, if you commission us, we'll do some research for you. There's all sorts of speculation as to how this could be addressed. Um, you know, and it goes from, you know, enhanced naval patrols to one of the, the madder things I've seen is is bringing back um, privateers. So you actually allow uh, private uh, companies to attack these ships without sanction. So yeah, there are there are all sorts of mad ideas out there as to as to how to address it. 
Thank you very much. Um, Alexander Dmitrenko has also asked, is there a STO platform that offers part ownership and investment in ships that's currently operating in Asia? Uh, we've heard a bit about Shipfinex and, you know, but is there, are there tokenization offers that are specifically focused on Asia that we found at the moment? Uh, there are, um, hold on, I'm just trying to remember the names of some of them. Um, there's eShip Finance, Oceanis, IO, Infinity Maritime, Singapore's your friends with this. Have a look at what Singapore's doing. I'm sure Busan will be hot on their heels, but I, I couldn't find uh, any examples from Busan at the moment. So uh, I think that's an area to look at. Thank you very much. And um, a, a last question, because we are running out of time. Nikki Holzhausen has asked you know, whether Professor Young could give any further details on Busan's innovative solutions to finance in this area. So you've run over some of the things that you're hoping will take place. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add on how Busan is going to innovate in this area? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the maritime finance, especially ship finance is uh, more and more of ship finance is covered by uh, policy financing institutions, you know, Exim banks, uh, Korea Development Banks and uh, Chinese lease financing. And uh, the first thing that uh, the industry ha has to uh, uh, solve is the, uh, I mean, how to make shipping industry more attractive to the commercial financing inst institutions. I mean, that's the first thing that we have to try. And the second thing is uh, the adoption of uh, innovative technologies. In, you know, a, a, as you said, you know, uh, uh, STOs and uh, other type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the technology, adoption of the technology uh, for, for ship finance. Well, thank you very much indeed. We are, I'm afraid, have run out of time, and it's a tribute to the interest um, that you've generated through the report and your comments today that we've had so many questions and engagement from our audience. Um, so it just remains for me to, first of all, um, thank um, Busan Finance Centre uh, for sponsoring the research and for joining with us in publishing uh, the report today. Um, we've got some uh, events coming up you might be interested in. Uh, tomorrow, a session on how pollinator-friendly uh, is the city of London. Uh, next Wednesday, how air pollution causes lung cancer in never smokers. Um, so some really uh, you know, different and interesting topics coming up. Um, but some, some further thanks. As I've mentioned, Busan Finance Center, Jessica and the team uh, really are grateful for uh, your support in this work and look forward to continuing uh, our partnership. Uh, Professor Yun, uh, it's been a delight to have you with us today and to hear your commentary um, on Busan uh, and its future in this particular area of maritime finance and very good luck um, with those developments going forward. Um, and finally, Simon, thank you so much for your contribution today, uh, but also for the work you've done uh, in um, you know, putting this together. Um, many thanks to all um, and for attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at future events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.